a certain degree, it doesn't matter what's written on a piece of paper. If you don't have people throughout the company and particularly in leadership roles who say, look, this is what we're going to do. This is what the company is about. Welcome to the new rules of business by Chief. I'm Lindsay Kaplan. And I'm Carolyn Childers, and we are the co-founders of Chief, the network of the most powerful women in business. And on each episode, we're diving deep on a topic that the C-suite is grappling with, alongside some of the best minds in business out there. So are you ready for this week's question, Carolyn? What do you got, Linz? Okay, so especially in the last year, but also in the last decade, corporate America has gone through a reckoning around social justice and engagement. Every week, it feels like there's another pressing social issue that companies need to respond to. So I want to know, to what extent should companies be developing public stances on social issues? Great question. It feels like there are so many companies that are criticized for not speaking up, but there are also companies who are criticized for speaking up, but in a performative way. Exactly. And also, what kind of work goes into the statements that companies are or aren't making? Because consumers don't always see everything. There's a whole company behind the curtain making policies, absorbing the backlash, and making these donations. One thing that we at Chief have grappled with is finding the right places where we feel our voice is important, but also relevant. And where is that line? Also, even though there's so many causes and movements that could benefit from corporate advocacy, at the end of the day, these leaders are also running a business and you can't address everything. But being choosy can lead to serious paralysis. What do you speak up about and how? While there are many that are new to this type of work, some companies have been doing this for decades. And that's why today we're talking to Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, legendary founders of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. They are experts on the balance between profit and purpose and have spent decades thinking about when and how to take a stand as a company. By now, Ben and Jerry's story is iconic. They're old friends who in 1978, after years of, in their words, failing at their original aspirations. Because Jerry wanted to be a doctor and couldn't get into med school. And Ben wanted to be a potter. But as he says, nobody wanted to buy his pots. <laughs> right. But after being quote unquote failures, they decided to start a community-based ice cream shop in Burlington, Vermont. The rest is well-known history. And even after it was bought by Unilever in 2000, Ben & Jerry's has remained the gold standard for corporate social engagement, weighing in on everything from farm aid and climate justice to voting rights and criminal justice reform. And of course, since we had Ben & Jerry in our studio, we couldn't help but ask them about their legendary partnership. As co-founders ourselves, we wanted to get some of their secrets about just how they've been able to maintain such a successful working relationship for decades. Well, thank you both for joining us on our podcast, Ben and Jerry. You were both cherished member favorites at our chief event. And so we were thrilled to have you come on the podcast. I'd love to dive in and hear a little bit of your legendary founding story. I'm sure you were asked this all the time. But just in case our listeners haven't heard it, how did you both get started on building Ben & Jerry's ice cream? Well, we met in seventh grade gym class. We were the two slowest, fattest kids in the class. And there'd be the whole class running around the track and half a lap behind would be me and Jerry. And, uh, you know, you make pretty close friends with whoever you find there at the back of the pack. It's lonely at the back of the pack. So I went to college and tried to get into medical school and never got in, then dropped out of several colleges and worked a series of jobs and was not really on a career path. And since we were both failing at everything we were trying to do, we thought we would get together and do something that was fun. And we did always like to eat quite a bit. So we naturally thought we would do something with food. 
So Carolyn and I are co-founders. We did not meet in junior high. But as you've gone through this working relationship, I'm curious about conflict and disagreements. I think this comes up a lot with business partners, and I suspect a lot of it is glossed over. I know from listening to you before, you both have very distinctive domains and a lot of respect for each other, but would love to hear about how you've worked through conflicts in the past and remain such great friends today. You know, I think one of the keys to us not being in conflict was that we had very defined areas of responsibility. So Jerry was doing production. He was making the ice cream and I was doing sales and marketing. And he didn't want to do what I was doing, and I didn't want to do what he was doing. And he was really good at what he was doing, quite obviously. So that was part of it. By the time we started working together, we were 26 at that point. And so we had been friends a long time. We'd gone through a lot together. And when we actually started the business, we were both completely overwhelmed. It was completely chaotic. And there was no opportunity to disagree about anything. We were grabbing onto things as quickly as we can so as not to fall off any cliffs. So that that was the nature of how we got going. Uh, I think Ben holds stronger opinions than I do about many things. And so if somebody has a strong opinion about it and the other guy doesn't really have much of an opinion at all, there's not really a conflict. There were very few times that, that there were conflicts. They were often about ice cream flavors. Well, now I have to ask, what kind of arguments did you get into about ice cream flavors? It was about the size of the chunk. <laughs> I wanted really big chunks. And Jerry wanted a larger amount of smaller chunks. So this argument raged on. You know, I think part of it is that Jerry really wanted every spoonful to have a chunk in it. And I felt it was okay to miss an occasional spoonful as long as the next spoonful had a really big chunk. But eventually we compromised and we decided to do whole lot of really big chunks. And so what if it costs more? Well, I have extreme envy of you both that you are this far into your partnership and the size of the chunks is the biggest argument or conflict or disagreement that you had in the business. You are obviously known for amazing ice cream. But I think one of the things that makes you such iconic legends is also how much Ben and Jerry's has stood for social causes. At what point did you all really start to infuse the idea of purpose and social impact into the business that you were building? I think it was something that evolved over time. When we began our little ice cream shop. We we had this single homemade ice cream parlor in Burlington, Vermont. And our idea at the time was to be a little community-based store, a place where people could hang out and we could get involved in community activities. Uh, we threw little local festivals. We showed free outdoor movies in the summer, things of, of that scale and of that scope. And we didn't really have a larger purpose per se. And I think over the years, as the business grew, we became much more aware of the impact that businesses have, not just in their local communities, but on larger communities as well. And we wanted to try to use the power of the business to help address those. And, you know, honestly, that was something that Ben really led the effort on. We certainly didn't disagree about it, but I am right at the top of the list of conflict avoiders. 
and you know, I think Ben is is really you, you wanted small chunks. I wanted a manageable agenda. That's what I was looking for. I I like to work inside the box. I like to know what my job is. I think Ben has a larger vision, and not only that, he has the courage to be outspoken about things that can be emotional things for people. I think, you know, as the business got to be more well-known and as the media would, would come to us, we decided to that we had a responsibility to use that platform for justice, to promote social benefits for people who were oppressed economically, racially, or by the power of our bombs. You know, for Lindsay and I, obviously, Chief has a huge social mission, and there's so much that we want to do as a platform. But especially today, it feels like every day there is another event and another cause. And you want to do good and right by all of them. But at some point, you also are running a business. So how did you guys think through which areas you wanted to focus, how deeply or broadly you would go, and how you would define that for yourself as a company? Yeah, that that did become an issue. You know, I wanted to get involved in more and more issues as more and more issues came up. And we started to realize that Ben and Jerry's as an entity couldn't be powerful in terms of doing anything unless we focused on a smaller number of issues. And so we decided at the board of directors level to have a social mission focus area, or maybe it was three foci that we would decide on kind of each year. And then it became a question of, well, how do we decide which, which issues to focus on? And at, at one point, we felt like, well, the, we should get our employees to tell us what they cared most about. And, you know, what came back was that they, the issue they cared most about was children and families. And the, in parallel, we also started to, to understand that if you ask a, pro, a cross section of the population, most any question, the answer that you get is, middle of the road. If you look at what Ben and Jerry's gets involved in, it is around justice and equality. So when the company gets involved in climate issues or environmental issues, it's with the lens and the focus on climate justice. And when Ben and Jerry's gets involved in uh, racial issues. It's around racial justice. And in Europe and the UK, the company is involved in uh, refugee and asylum seeker rights. So it, it's the people who are being impacted, who just don't have the voice, who don't have the power. You know, as Ben would say, it's the people getting screwed by these powerful interests. And Ben and Jerry's, I think, tries to use its voice and its ice cream to be looking at things from that vantage point. I think that Ben and Jerry's will have certain issues, social mission issues that it is working on day in, day out, year after year. But every once in a while, something happens that is so important and so egregious that the company feels like essentially as a citizen in the society, we need to make our voice heard just as an individual in our society needs to make their voice heard because we are part of this community. We are not just a thing that extracts from the community. We're part of it. Have you ever felt like it was risky or that you've questioned what role you should or shouldn't play as a business or company in some of these social issues? I think at the beginning, as you say, when it wasn't so common, 
I would be pushing Ben and Jerry's to to take these stands, and and there would be a tremendous amount of pushback internally from our management and board of directors because they felt like it was not proper for a business to take a stand on social and and political issues. And business has always been a very, very political creature. It's just that business does its politics covertly, that it's business that controls our legislation through lobbying. Uh, They spend billions of dollars on influencing our, our legislation. And it's business that owns our media and determines what it is we see and hear. And it's business that controls elections through campaign contributions. So their business is incredibly political, always has been. It's just that they're political only in their own narrow self-interest. And so at Ben & Jerry's, we were talking about our company taking a stand in the public interest. And that somehow didn't seem right uh, to a lot of people, mostly because it just hadn't been done before. And also because the predominant belief in the business community was based on Milton Friedman type economics, uh, saying that the only legitimate purpose of a business is to maximize profits. But Ben, don't don't you think there's a different expectation from consumers and the general public now? As you keep saying, people want companies that have attitude, that that are genuine and authentic. They don't want companies just to be selling products or providing services. Yeah, I think that's true. I think starting about 10 years ago or more, there there started to be data-driven consumer research showing that that's what consumers wanted, especially younger consumers. They want companies that are authentic and have attitude. And, you know, the interesting thing about being authentic is that you can't fake it. And companies that did not have any particular social values read that consumer research and they told their marketers and advertising agencies that now we want you to make us appear to be authentic. And, you know, that doesn't really work that well. So I also think that there is a increasing recognition in the population and, you know, and perhaps even in the business community that business is the most powerful element in our society which is a fairly new situation. And I think that there is more and more of a realization that if we are going to address any of the serious problems that are confronting us, it's not going to happen unless business takes its proper role as a responsible member of the society and contributes to the society instead of continuing to just extract from the society. You know, it's been, you know, the refrain of business all the time that the way we contribute to our society is that we create jobs. I think that's bullshit. I mean, without workers, business could not exist. Workers allow businesses to exist. Businesses tend to externalize a lot of the problems that they create in our society. The major polluters are businesses. It doesn't appear on their balance sheets. And especially the need for it to happen authentically. Uh, Lindsay says all the time, it's like making a cake and then trying to put the butter in after. Like it has to be a part of what you are from the very beginning. And I think so much of your story talks about how much it was a part of how you thought about the community from day one. If it has to come from business, and business is now, in your mind, running government, will it ever truly come from a place of what is good for society? Or will this only be driven by the data showing that young people love woke companies? I think that there is a conjunction that there are young people that are starting companies, and they are woke. 
and they are very easily able to be woke and have their businesses operate in a woke way. And I think that some existing businesses are starting to get it. So is your question, are they doing it just because it's just another standard part of marketing that's doing consumer research and learning that in order for them to sell more product, they have to act more woke? Yeah, yeah there's definitely some of that going on. And that's it's not so bad. It's even better if if they are actual woke and they're doing woke stuff. So we've established that there's increased consumer pressure for companies to exact social responsibility. But do you see companies today stepping up? They are stepping up. I don't know if it's more obligated or if things have become so obvious, whether it's the murder of George Floyd or trying to undermine voting rights, but things are so in your face, you just cannot ignore them. Are there companies that you look to these days and say they're doing it right? Patagonia and Dr. Bronner's. I don't think they spend much money on advertising because they don't have to, because they're forming a very powerful relationship with their consumers based on shared values. And there's really no stronger connection that you can make with your consumers than one based on shared values. It's not based on percentage discount promotions. It's not based on coming up with a a funny or cute or sentimental or sexy ad. It's based on something a whole lot more deeper than that. And you can continue to build on that. Uh, It just gains momentum over time. You bring up a great point there, Ben, that companies like Patagonia, like Dr. Bronner's, have a long view. And, you know, they are not overnight sensations. You know, Patagonia, a lot more people have heard of it and a lot more people are buying their products now. But Patagonia has been around and doing what they've been doing for a while. And same with Dr. Bronner's. We would also all put Ben and Jerry's in the category of being consistent about your values throughout the years. So when Unilever acquired the company in 2000, I know that you both took a step back from the day to day, but how did you ensure that those values were maintained through that transition? You know, I I think there came a point in the growth of the business when Jerry and I were still running it, where we, we came to understand that we wanted the values of the business to not be just dependent on Jerry and myself. And we made a very concerted effort to have the social values be as much a part of the company as really high quality in in amazing flavors is a part of the company. And it was a a difficult and time consuming process. We thought that the odds were that we would not be successful. And today, we are amazed that even though the company has been sold to this huge multinational conglomerate, the values of the company have survived and they seem to grow and prosper and do a bunch of stuff that, you know, more than what we used to do. Yeah, I mean, so... We started as this ice cream shop in 1978. Uh, About 10 years later, we formalized a mission statement that talked about a social mission as well as a product mission and an economic mission. And so having that statement written that we could talk about, that we could point to, that we could say, look, this is what the company is about was essential. At the same time, it is really dependent upon the people you have at the company. To a certain degree, it doesn't matter what's written on a piece of paper. If you don't have people throughout the company and particularly in leadership roles who say, look, this is what we're going to do. This is what the company is about. It certainly helps that the company has been and continues to be 
successful, both financially and and from a mission point of view. But, you know, as, as Ben has often told me, and he's absolutely right, there there is this inexorable drift towards the mainstream, towards the middle, to be risk averse. And, you know, it, it kind of doesn't matter what Ben and Jerry were talking about 20 years ago. You've got to have people in there now who are still pushing, who are still, you know, coming up against naysayers, who are, who've got to be saying, look, this is what, this is who we are. This is what we do. And not everybody agrees with it. And through it all, Ben and Jerry sells more ice cream every year than the year before. Well, I'll say, first of all, it's become very clear to us who is the Ben and who's the Jerry of (laughs) Carolyn and Lindsay. Agreed. I think that is very clear. Well, this has been wonderful. So to close out, I would love to hear what's the best piece of leadership advice each of you has ever received? I don't know if this is exactly leadership advice, but, you know, as Ben and Jerry's was starting to succeed, we had people tell us that, you know, you should pay attention because you're going to pass the same people on the way down that you pass on the way up. And that was good human advice. You know, Ben and Jerry's has met with so much success, and yet I am so completely aware of the amazing business people out there who are really smart, who work really hard, who do an incredible job, and they don't have the same level of success that Ben and Jerry's has had. And I think there's there's a certain element of good fortune involved, and I try to appreciate that. You know, it's really all about hiring. I mean, you know, if you hire great people, that's... (laughs) <laughs> that's the huge majority of the job. You know, I'm working with a guy now who talks about attitude versus aptitude and that you need to hire for attitude because you can always teach the task that needs to be done. If you want to maintain your values, you need to hire for people who deeply believe in those values. Ben and Jerry, thank you so much. What I took away is Ice cream pints are never big enough. (laughs) Hire good people, be good to people, and try to hoard as much ice cream in your freezer as possible. (laughs) I think you came away with all the messages. (laughs) Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. This is great. That was Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield of Ben and Jerry's. I loved hearing their story, especially the point they made about hiring to your values. Every company is going to have to pass that torch someday. And it's a good reminder that the values have to be baked in on an institutional and a personal level for everyone who comes in that door. I also really loved them talking about their partnership. It's just so clear how much trust is at the foundation of the success that they've had. They must have done so many trust falls into ice cream. (laughs) Lindsay, I trust you, but I don't know that I would ever trust you in a trust fall. I would absolutely fall on my ass. (laughs) That's because I have noodle arms and you know it. So we'd both collapse. But we'd do it together. Together, yeah. That's all for this episode of The New Rules of Business by Chief. You can find us on LinkedIn, or if you're interested in joining the Chief Network, apply to be a member at chief.com. Thank you to Sharon Yi, Courtney Conley, Katrina Conan and Rial, Blaine Edens, and Gabriella Margarino at Chief. And to our production team, Pod People, Rachel King, Matt Sav, Amy Machado, Andy Bosnack, Madison Lesby, Michelle O'Brien, and Veronica Simonetti. Our music is by Colin Hatch. I'm Lindsay Kaplan. And I am Carolyn Childers. Thanks for listening. <laughs>